I'm willing to bet that this is probably one of the worst computer setups you've ever seen, whether online or in real life, and for a few different reasons. Now, I could just cut the video there and get straight into the benchmarks, but including the backstory provides an example of what not to do. I made a few mistakes in the planning of this build, and ultimately it didn't turn out quite how I expected it to. Either way, I've got the video split up into chapters, so if you want to skip ahead, then go for it. I hope you enjoy. Picture this, you're me, sitting in my dorm room a month or two back, and you decide that you want to build a new test bench system to benchmark different computer parts for your YouTube channel. Being the cheapo that I am, I found that Goodwill had an online store where they sell complete working computer systems for under $100 every day. And these aren't just crappy Chromebooks either. These cheap systems are coming with respectable i3, i5, and i7 CPUs with up to 16 gigabytes of RAM. After shopping around for a few days, I settled on this, the HP ProDesk 400G1. I recently featured it in another video, so I won't go too into depth, but for $35, it came with an i3-4130, 8GB of RAM, and a 500GB hard drive. Pretty good for the price. Obviously, this isn't the best when it comes to minor performance, so I decided to make a few upgrades as well. I ended up buying two 8GB sticks of DDR3 RAM for $40 and pulled my V5800 Pro out of storage, which I bought for $15. You've likely never heard of it since it's an older workstation graphics card made by ATI back in 2012, but it's actually quite powerful, for the price. The other reason why I chose this card is that it requires no additional power cables, relying solely on the 75 watts provided by the PCIe lane. With that, the only thing standing between me and a cheap gaming system was the fact that I had to get it to actually work. The first thing I wanted to do was transplant the motherboard into a real case so I can throw in a full-size graphics card. Luckily, I had a donor case lying around and was going to just use that. That is, until I realized that the power supply wasn't the standard ATX form factor. And I couldn't exactly change it out because the motherboard didn't require your standard 20 or 24 pin connectors and actually required two 6 pins instead. This is when everything started to go wrong. So I couldn't use the other case because the power supply was the wrong form factor and I couldn't switch out the power supply because the motherboard required some unique connections. I also couldn't use the V5800 Pro because the case I had to use didn't have enough space. Luckily, I had an old 16x to 16x PCIe adapter that I could use to run the card externally. So I plugged it all in with the V5800 Pro and it didn't work. After modifying the case into a few different pieces with the use of some sheet metal snips, I finally had enough room to put in the graphics card. Or so I thought. I was so close to achieving my goal, and the last thing stopping me from playing PUBG in glorious 720p was the front I.O. connector. Every single graphics card I had was too big to fit in the PCIe lane, so I, uh, you know, just bent it out of the way. There's probably a way to bypass this, but I found that simply bending the connector out of the way was much easier. And with that, I finally plugged in the V5800 Pro, booted up the system, and nothing. What? This card worked, I knew it did, but for some reason the system didn't like it, like a failed organ transplant. So I swapped in a 4850 to see if that would work, but nuh uh uh, it required an additional 6 pin connector, something the power supply didn't have. Eventually I found this lying around, a SATA to 6 pin connector. Perfect. Let me stop you right there. See, a SATA power connector can supply up to 54 watts of power, while a 6 pin can supply up to 75 watts. See the problem here? Yeah, it would f***ing melt. Kinda like what happened to this guy. What I needed was a dual SATA to single 6 pin connector to power the card without risking damage. But I didn't have that. Not that it would even matter though, because the PSU wouldn't be able to supply that much power. With the upgrades I did, the load wattage jumped up to 247 watts, with a recommended PSU wattage of 297 watts. This is a bit more than the maximum 240 watts that the PSU was rated for. Now, out of curiosity, given that the 4850 worked when directly plugged in, I decided to see if it would work with the riser I thought was dead. So imagine my surprise when I booted up the system again and was graced by the beautiful USB 2.0 failure screen. I again tested the V5800 Pro, GT730, and even a 9800 GTX Plus with the riser, and none of the others worked. So I decided to use the GT730 instead, because although it didn't work with the riser, it would work without it for some reason. Unfortunately, the 730 costs nearly twice as much as the V5800 Pro does on eBay, and I strongly dislike the 730 because of its myriad of variations. But alas, the circumstances forced my hand, and I chose to use it. You can find a decent 730 for about $40 on eBay, and that brings the total cost of this system to $115.
The GT730 I'm using in this system was a decent version. Made for HP's OEM systems, this 730 was built on the 28 nanometer process and released in 2014 with a core clock of 731 MHz. It also came with 2 GB of DDR3 VRAM clocked in 900 MHz with a 64 bit bus width. So, how does it perform? Well, you get what you paid for, and I didn't pay much at all. I decided on a few different tests, including gameplay benchmarks and general usage, and the results were good considering the total cost. First thing I did was just see how well it could run Windows, and it didn't disappoint. While installing a few different programs, the computer did slow down a bit, but that was largely due to the older hard drive. Aside from that, multitasking with Google Chrome wasn't bad at all, and I'd be more than happy to use this computer as my daily driver if not for its lack of capability in modern games. Speaking of which, the first game I tested was CSGO, with promising results with the lowest settings in 1080p. For this game, the frame rate figures were taken from the built-in counter provided by Steam, ranging mostly between 50 and 60 FPS. Tabbing out to check Task Manager showed that the bottleneck was the GT730, and this stayed true in most other games I tested. Still, the game never significantly slowed down, and enemies were always clearly visible, so I'd say the performance is enough to play the game competitively. Next up was GTA V, which I tested with two different resolutions, both with the lowest settings selected. In 1080p, the average frame rate was an acceptable 28 FPS and was surprisingly stable. To increase this figure, I tried dropping the resolution down to 720p, and the average frame rate climbed all the way up to 48 FPS. This also was very stable, with no stuttering or screen tearing at all. Personally, I think I'd run this game as 720p if I were to play through it, but 1080p should be doable as well. The next game I tested was Minecraft. In 1080p, with low medium settings selected and 11 chunks being rendered, the average frame rate was a solid 63 FPS. In this test, it seemed like the CPU was actually the bottleneck of the system, being frequently pinned at 100% utilization. But that's just how Minecraft is, as loading in new chunks for the first time requires substantial processing power. After that, I decided to really stress the system components by attempting to run PUBG. As expected, this didn't go too well, even with the lowest settings and a resolution of 720p. Luckily, after landing on the ground, the frame rate did rise from the single digits to the upper 20s and lower 30s. Given that this can be a very tactical, competitive game, I don't think this system would be able to provide a great experience, but you would still be able to play it. Following PUBG was Far Cry 4, which had decent results. With the lowest settings and a resolution of 800 by 600 the computer was able to manage an average frame rate of 51 FPS. Unfortunately, it's painfully obvious just how bad the game looked with these settings, so I'd probably increase the resolution to at least 720p if I were planning a playthrough. Regardless, 51 FPS is nothing to scoff at, and the game was very stable, so I can't complain. The second to last game I ran was Just Cause 3. With the lowest settings and a resolution of 720p, the average frame rate wasn't great and came to be only 23 FPS. The CPU did see significant utilization, but it didn't seem to impact frame rate much, meaning that the 730 was once again the largest bottleneck, but somehow the game still felt playable. I don't know if that's an ode to the consistent stability or my 174 hours of playtime, but it still felt playable, just not great. For the last game I wanted to give the computer a bit of a break and hopped into some dirt rally. With ultra low settings and 720p, the average frame rate of the built in benchmark was an impressive 87 FPS. Granted, the game looked horrible, but there's definitely some wiggle room to increase the settings a bit. All in all, this computer held up pretty well. If you walked into Best Buy or Walmart right now and tried to buy a desktop computer for $120, they would probably just laugh at you and say they don't have anything that cheap aside from Chromebooks. That makes this computer a good bang for the buck and surprisingly capable considering the price. Will it be able to run the latest games? Maybe, depending on how demanding they are and how low you're willing to push the settings, but this isn't a bad computer setup for a low entry level computer. Something like this would be good for a kid who only plays Roblox and Minecraft, or literally anyone who doesn't need large amounts of processing power. What surprised me the most though was the i3-4130. Considering its age, it still has a lot of life left in it, and was not the bottleneck for most of the benchmarks. If you were to throw in a low profile GTX 1650, you could likely play most modern titles. Probably not with the highest settings, but you could likely get away with running popular games like Cyberpunk 2077 or Battlefield 2042, although I can't recommend buying the latter. But don't get me wrong, the system still has plenty of room for improvements. For instance, if I were to do this again, I would only buy one 8GB stick of RAM for a total of 12 rather than 16. Most games didn't ever use more than 8, so if you needed to cut costs by $20, then I'd say that's a good place to do so. 
I would then take that extra $20 and try to get a better graphics card. Something better than the 730, and at least as powerful as the 750Ti. If there's any extra funds left over after that, I would try to get a 240 to 500 gigabyte SSD to install Windows on, and maybe a few games as well. The old hard drive was the main bottleneck when it came to general system usage, and we all know that Windows loves to run background updates to suck up our system resources, especially storage devices. But aside from that, the build didn't turn out that bad, and I'll be able to test a few more graphics cards on this system. Oh, and we also have a community Discord server where we discuss a, a variety of topics. Link in the description. Regardless, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or related comments, then leave them below and I'll be sure to respond to it. While you're at it, consider subscribing or leaving a like because it genuinely helps me out. That's about it. Have a great day. Bye.